Good. So today we are move this thing over. So today we're going to answer uh, the question, what's next? Okay. So let's let's step uh, step back a couple of steps. Um, so we're starting chapter five, but in order to understand the importance of chapter five, we have to see what was missing in the previous chapters. So I want to go back to the previous chapter where um, we described how if you have a circulating current that uh, that generates a magnetic field and that magnetic field has a magnetic moment and that magnetic moment causes it to want to turn in a direction that is pointing in the direction that the externally applied magnetic field is dictating. And we tied that to the discussion from the chapter before that, where we started with the Lorentz force. And we said, there's a Lorentz force on um, acting on um, moving charged particles. And uh, that, that means that if you have a, uh, a, a wire that has a circulating current, and we ignore for now how that current is set up, but there are many ways in which you could do that. You have a circulating current, um, then as a result of that Lorentz force that's acting on all those moving charges, this wire will experience a torque. And that torque is the exact same torque that you get if you look at the, uh, at the same problem from the, from the point of view of chapter four. So chapters three and chapters four, I explained to you, were, were basically two windows into the same, into the same problem. So we, but, but what we did not do is we said, well, there's a torque and it's going to turn, but we did not very, very accurately describe what happens when it turns. So what, what do I mean by that? Well, so you have this circulating loop, uh, I mean, this circular loop with a circulating current. And we know that when there's a circulating current, there's a Lorentz force, so therefore it will turn. But now, here's the funny thing. When it turns, now there's a velocity in the rotational direction. And that velocity, in addition, will give you a Lorentz force. So that is what I meant by what happens next. So we, strictly speaking, we, we only described what the direction of motion would be. So in other words, what the torque would be and how the torque develops depending on the angles. But we didn't actually describe the process of the wire physically rotating through the field. So that part we need to add. And that's what we will do today. And that's, uh, that's the subject of the Faraday's law. And Faraday's law is the thing that we're going to slap on to Maxwell 2. So we'll find that the electric field is not conservative for very specific types of cases, which involve magnetic fields. The Lorentz force revisited. What happens next? So um, let's let's go back to our basic principle of the Lorentz force. So um, if we have some magnetic field, so that's our magnetic field. Field is. Uh, Let's, for simplicity's sake, assume that it is uniform. So that means that the spacing between these fields, uh, field lines is constant. And that's some externally applied magnetic field. And now let's say we've got some point charge, Q, and it's moving with the velocity V. We know that as a result, of that particle moving through a magnetic field, there's going to be a Lorentz force. And the Lorentz force, again, as we usually do, we can get it in three ways. You know, there's a QV crossed with B, B in this direction, so the force is up. I can um, also point my fingers in the direction of QV and then catch the magnetic field lines in the palm of my hand with the left hand. Also, field is up, force is up. I'm not going to do the third one because life's too short, but that's the direction of the Lorentz force. Okay, so that is the direction of the Lorentz force. And then we, we described what happens when, um, when, these, uh, when these are freely moving particles in 
in a sense that uh, this is a point particle and um, when there's a Lorentz force that's acting perpendicular on this velocity, the only thing that changes is the direction, right? Because it's not gonna change the speed. So, and as a result, because that Lorentz force is always perpendicular to the velocity, as a result, it's gonna go in circles. Now, that is what happens when these are particles that are free to move as point particles. But what if instead this particle was part of a wire? So instead, I'm gonna draw this right next to it. So let's say I got this wire here and it's a metal wire and it's thin. So that's a thin metal wire. And um, if this wire is initially is not carrying any current, but let's say I move this wire with a speed that is uniform in this direction. So I go up, uh, same speed that we were using before for this point particle. But now this is a wire and not a point particle. And the question is, how is this wire fundamentally different from a point particle? Well, in, in a couple of ways. First of all, this wire, if it's, for instance, if it's made of, you know, if it's a, if it's a metal, it will have um, pinned positive charges, but it will have freely moving negative charges. That is the electrons. Um, if this is a if this is a tube made of uh, salt water, then it's got positive and negative ions. Um, if it's a superconductor, it's got Cooper pairs. But let's not get too complicated. Um, so let's just assume that for this very simple model, we are going to consider some kind of a charge here. That is one of those charges that is free to move. And again, we're gonna assume that we ignore, we can, we can safely ignore the microscopic nature of exactly how this conduction occurs. And we can say that uh, we just assume that there are positively charged particles in this wire and they're free to move. Now, these wires are gonna be, uh, sorry, these charges, when they move to the right, they, uh, and we'll experience a force that is up. Okay, so, all right, so same force. The Lorentz force. Well, now this is where the picture of the moving wire and the picture of the moving charge changes because when, when this thing moves to the right under some kind of a uniform velocity, um, it doesn't necessarily wanna rotate. I mean, it could, but it doesn't need to. So in other words, these charges are, are tied to this rod and all they can do is move up and down the rod. So as a result, because these, uh, these are positive charges, as a result of the Lorentz force, um, we'll get an accumulation of charges on this side. So positive charges on this side and then negative charges on this side. So we get a um, we get a charged wire. So just by moving this wire through a magnetic field, we can separate the charges, and you get the positive charges on one side and the negative charges on the other. Okay. So um, so as this wire is moving, the the top becomes positively charged and the bottom becomes negatively charged. And that is something that is independent of the microscopic nature of the, um, of the conduction. And now, um, what, what does that look like? So let me, let me draw this wire again. So we'll get you know, positively charged here, negatively charged there. So as a result, because this one's positively charged, that one's negatively charged. As a result, there's an electric field that develops. So that looks like this. And when this wire moves and the electric field is, um, is generated, at some point equilibrium sets in. And that means that we can ask ourselves, what is the effect of this equilibrium condition on this moving charge? So in equilibrium, and what we mean by equilibrium means that the, um, there's two ways to phrase this. One, uh, after a long time, 
time with uniform v. So we don't change the velocity at some point. We, you know, we just we hold it. Um, or we can say um, once the charge distribution has settled, there is um, the net force. So F net force on the charges is zero because they're not moving anymore. So that means that this electric field that is pointing in this direction is canceled by some other field. And that's the field that is the magnetomotive field. So we're going to say that's Q um, times E, that's the external field, plus some other field that's trying to separate it, right? Because the electric field is trying to do, the, the classic electric field is trying to do this. So that's your regular Coulomb force. And then the Lorentz force is trying to do the opposite thing, is trying to move it in this direction. And in equilibrium, for all of these particles, this relation must hold. So the force up and equals the force down. So therefore, that electric field that is uh, generated by separating the charges is exactly uh, canceled by the electric field, which is induced by the magnetic motion. OK, so what is the nature of that electric field? So. Um, it's uh, it's 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 a really rather interesting uh, thing. So the the easiest way to think about it is to say um, consider a charge all the way at the bottom. Charge all the way at the bottom. At oops, the bottom. So that's our wire again. And now uh, we have a Q here. So it's got the same speed. And it's got a Q here. And this Q is going to move up. And when it, uh, when it moves up, it moves up under the, um, under the effect of the Lorentz force. So the work done by the Lorentz force is this times the path, where this is the path. Oops. So that's the work done by the time it's made it all the way here. And we know that the Lorentz force is QV cross B. So QV cross B. And now, um, just like before, when we were talking about um, when we were talking about um, you know electric fields, we uh, usually we divide the the effect of charge out because even though we need a charge for this phenomenon to occur, the whole phenomenon is proportional to Q. So instead of carrying these Qs all the time, we're going to uh, define a new physical property, and we're going to call this E. And that's the same E that we saw when we were talking about batteries. So this is the electromotive force. So it's the electromotive force. And we're going to define that as our work done per unit charge. And the work done is in joules, and the unit of charge is Coulomb. So joules per Coulomb. So the electromotive force actually is also in volts or joules per coulomb, just like batteries. Okay, so there was a question for the record now. So the question was why we were considering movement from here all the way to there. Well, that's just to introduce this principle in a somewhat more intuitive manner. Ultimately, we'll have to consider charges all across and we'll need to consider DL vector segments in infinitesimal um, increments, but there will still be some kind of uh, electromotive force associated with it. Um, and it will end up looking exactly the same, it's just um, mathematically it's a little harder to track. So this is the electromotive force and um, there's a, um, 
so therefore it's uh, the electromotive force it's that l vector dotted with v crossed with p now there is a um there is a, a a triple vector product rule that says that if you have a product like this so you, that involves three vectors um with a dot product and a cross product you can do this same cyclic permutation that uh, we were doing for cross products by themselves there's a um, section a54 in the book so a54 if you want to review that um, and it says that basically i can make this v take the place of l this b take the place of uh, v and the l moves to the place of b so now i'm getting v crossed with b crossed with l And now I'll do that one more time and we'll get a B crossed with L crossed with V. Now I'll, um, I'll explain now why I did this two times. The reason is that now we have here on the right hand side, um, a geometric object only that is the path and the velocity. So that's a geometric object, something that has units of meters times meters per second. So that looks like a geometric object with some kind of a time dependence. And then this is the thing that's external and it's nice to keep the external thing out. Now, um, this thing, L cross V, oops, has units of um, meters per second. Okay, so let's consider, let's let's look at what that means. Okay, so uh, if L is in this direction and V is in this direction, the cross product is pointing perpendicular to those two. So that's uh, pointing in um, this direction. So that's L crossed with V. Let me make sure I did that right, L. Okay, so the cross product's pointing in this direction. And um, uh, L is perpendicular to V. So let's say if this thing is one meter and the speed is one meter per second, then one second later, this thing will have moved one meter over to the side. And as it's doing that, it's moved one meter squared in terms of surface area. That surface area, that's the surface area that's kind of covered here. If it moves faster, so for instance, if this is one meter and it's moving with two meters per second, then one second later, it'll have covered this imaginary geometric object, a surface area that is twice as big. So this, this thing, this L cross V, has everything that looks like um, surface area covered or imaginarily painted, if you want to think about this as like a paint roller, the paint roller goes over it. So it's a surface area painted per second. So if it goes slow, it's small. If it goes fast, it's large. If the wire is bigger, it's bigger. So this project, uh, uh, sorry, this object called S L cross V, it's um, it's some um, delta A, delta T, and we'll make that A with a vector because the A has a normal that is pointing in that direction. So it's the, it's the area painted per unit time. So this area painted, um, some people call this area swept or area painted. It's the same thing. You have to imagine that this thing is kind of a paint roller, you move it over, and one second later, it'll have moved, and that's the speed. So with that definition, we now get a B dotted with some delta A vector delta T. So that's the electromotive force. So this is the, this is the thing that's gonna do work and moving this charge from one side to the other. So this goes here and we apply that 
to this object called L cross V. And now we have the electromotive force as a function of just whatever externally applied magnetic field we have and some geometric object that says how big it is and how fast it's moving. And that's our delta A, delta T. Okay, now back to, back to the original, um, the original, uh, this, this original equilibrium condition. This electromotive force has the exact same units as a, um, as joules, right? And that electromotive force is the thing that is balancing the externally applied, the externally applied, um, externally uh, generated electric field. All right. I'll, I'll get back to that in a little bit, but just remember that we still need to answer this question. All right. So, because if we, if we want to compare, if we want to compare electric fields with EMFs, then we need to have something that converts volts, because this is in volts, to electric fields. So we can compare this thing with this thing on an equal footing. So let's do that. Um, let's consider let's consider the um, the potential difference that exists between these two points in the field so that potential difference so the electrostatic is here um, wire so it's moving in this direction there's a field plus plus minus 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 plus plus that potential difference if you think about the path all the way from here to there because again it's easiest to think about it that way it would be the potential difference would be um, e dot l if the electric field is uniform and we expect it to be uniform but I'll get to that in a little bit. So that will be the potential difference from here to there, just purely as a function of this electric field that is induced because the charges are separated. So that potential difference, we can now say is competing with the electromotive force. So the electromotive force, uh -oh, where'd my electromotive force go? Yes. So compare this to the EMF. When we had the EMF, we started, we said, okay, we have this um, um, we had this work done divided by Q, which was um, F sub Q sorry, F sub L divided by Q dotted with L. And now we have them um, in, now we have them in uh, forms that are similar because this is, this is in a volt due to the electric field. This is in volts due to the EMF. And you see now that we have a dot product with an L and a dot product with an L. So if we combine these, we can say, uh, E plus V are balanced because this is E, F L over Q dotted with L plus, and that's this one, so that's negative, so minus E dot L is zero. And now we'll factor the L out, L factor, F Lorentz over Q minus E is zero. So they cancel each other out exactly. So this is the, um, the EMF pushing it in the opposite direction. And this is the electric field that is uh, generated in the other direction. So that's why, that's why the EMF pushes it up and the electric field 
pushes it down, and in the end, we'll have an equilibrium condition, and uh, they are pointing in the opposite direction. Okay, so summarizing, V goes down in this direction, goes down in, oh, sorry, goes down in this direction, and E goes up in that direction. So they both, um, they both look like volts and they just nicely balance each other out. All right. So as a result, we now have a potential difference between this point and that point. And that potential is real. That's actually a potential that you can use to, um, to drive a current. So let's connect this Let's connect this thing to a um, to something external. So I'm going to draw the magnetic field again. Now we'll take the magnetic field here, and we'll take the same wire. But then we connect that to some other wires, and then we'll Put a little current meter here and uh, let's give this thing some kind of a resistance. Okay, so this piece of the wire, this piece of the wire is in the magnetic field. So this whole loop is moving. So this whole loop is moving. Um, so this part of the loop is in the magnetic field and this part of the loop is not in the magnetic field. So there is an EMF that gets generated from here to there. So that is um, E is going in this direction. So now if you use Kirchhoff's voltage laws, this we treat as a battery. So Kirchhoff's voltage law, it says that that EMF minus, and because EMF is pointing in this direction, the charges are moved in that direction. And now we've connected this, so the charges can actually move this direction and as a result we got a current so minus r times i equals to zero so if the emf let's say um it's um let's let's call it a, a one meter wire with one meter per second speed then that emf is going to be one volt. Oh, with a, in a in a one Tesla field. Sorry, if B is one Tesla. Then that EMF is one volt. So then, if our R is one kilo ohm, I get a current that is one milliamp. Now. That is quite cool. So we can move, we can move a conducting material through a magnetic field, and we can use that to uh, extract a current. And that current we can use to dump heat into a resistor, or if you want to do something a little bit more sophisticated, you put a little light bulb there. And now what we have, ladies and gentlemen, is an electric generator. So this is how, in the most basic principle, you can generate electricity using a magnetic field and some kind of a motion. So we can convert mechanical motion, as long as we have a magnetic field, we can convert that to electric energy. So that's important. So we can convert mechanical motion to electric energy. And that's the basic principle of um, um, energy generation. So that's a, uh, it's a generator. Now, um, 
so so it's it's quite clear that you have an EMF, right? You have an EMF that's that's giving you a voltage here, and then that drives a current through here. But we we are strictly speaking, we're comparing apples to oranges a little bit because we're saying this EMF is something that is a quasi-static situation that is just giving you one volt between here and there. But now at the same time, we're dumping energy here. So exactly where does this energy come from? Because we did not really talk about this in terms of energy. We only talked about this in terms of a voltage between here and there. So that energy, you know, is there energy con conservation? And the answer is yes, because, check this out, this current, as soon as it starts to flow, it is now generating a Lorentz force. And this Lorentz force is going to be, and now we have a Lorentz force due to a Lorentz force due to a Lorentz force, so stick with me, it gets better. Um, so this, um, this current is gonna give you a Lorentz force. So as a result, you get another Lorentz force. So let's call it F Lorentz force two, which is IL crossed with B, where we can take our fingers of our right hand in the direction of IL, point it in the direction of B, and now that Lorentz force is pointing to the left. And this is a new Lorentz force, so I'm gonna need a new color. And I am um, using this one. So this Lorentz force, is pointing in this direction, whereas the Lorentz force that's driving the current is in this direction. So Lorentz force that's driving the current, but once the current starts to move, it generates a Lorentz force that is in the opposite direction to the velocity. And because it's in the opposite direction to the velocity, when you move this wire out of a magnetic field, or you know, through a magnetic field, the energy that you dump into this resistor comes because you are doing work against that force, because that force is trying to resist what you're trying to do to it. So uh, indeed, it's the induced F Lorentz force two that opposes the motion and work is being performed against that force. So is it, is it always pointing in the opposite direction? Why, yes it is. So check this out. If the velocity goes in the opposite direction, then the EMF goes in the opposite direction. And therefore the current is driven in the opposite direction and therefore the Lorentz force is in the opposite direction. So this thing, this Lorentz force is always going to oppose that speed. And that's why we're okay in terms of um, energy conservation. And we'll do, we'll do some problems with, um, with actual energies, but now you'll see pretty completely in one picture, the, the whole mechanism. All right, so for the record, there was a really good question here and it says, well, what happens once if this wire moves out of the magnetic field? Well, once it's out of the magnetic field, there's no longer a Lorentz force that's giving you an EMF and therefore there's also no longer this force that's moving it back. So if we make a boundary here, so where this is B and this is B is zero, so this is B is something, B some not, then um, beyond here, beyond here, EMF is zero, right? Because the magnetic field's gone, EMF is gone. This induced EMF is, um, is, is a little weird. And there are many, many things happening. And um, for, for instance, one of the things that, 
that always uh, makes makes the understanding harder is that now all of a sudden you have two Lorentz forces. So there's a Lorentz force that's driving the current, and then as a result, there's another Lorentz force that's working in the opposite direction. Um, so I hope at least you understand um, the, the big picture. So you have moving moving wires that move through a magnetic field. There's an induced EMF that looks like a voltage. And as a result, you can generate a current. But there's a whole bunch of things that we haven't talked about. So, uh, so let's try to fill in the blanks. So the first thing I want to talk about um, is this thing that somebody, somebody brought up. And that is that why are we considering moving charges from here all the way to there? And I said, well, that's not strictly necessary. Um, uh, but I want to first give you the big picture. So let's, let's fill in the blanks here. Um, so we start by recognizing, as usual, that if there is some kind of a some kind of a um, um, EMF from here to there, and that is a function of length, then we should be able to describe that as a function of length. So that is a d e. You can always do that. Now let's pull up our um, our original definition for for our EMF. So in in this case, all of these pieces of wire are moving with the same velocity and through the same magnetic field. So if we want to write this in differential form, this is the only thing that we can integrate over. So we want to integrate over length. That means that we convert that to differential form. So we'll take a DE um, is the D version of that funny object that we had before. So it's the derivative of that thing. So that means that we get a DL vector with a V crossed with B. So this looks a little funny, but I hope that this explains to you what's happening with, with E. So because V cross B is the same for all of those segments of the wire, that DL vector dotted with V cross B is something that increases monotonically. So you get L times, times V crossed with B. So because it increases monotonically, let me write that down, because DE does not depend on L, E is a linear function of L. So it goes, if we have um, at the bottom of the wire, and if it's one meter wire, it goes from zero to one volt, then it goes from zero to one volt in a nicely linear fashion. So if we draw that, we'll say the wire is moving in this direction. If this is E is zero, and this is E is one, so we go from zero to one, then halfway E is one half, and these are all volts. So it goes linearly up from here to there. And as a result, because that EMF is balanced in equilibrium so without you getting a current, because that EMF is balanced by the electric field that gets generated because you're moving the charges. So there's a, this becomes positively charged, it becomes negatively charged. As a result, also V is a linear function of L. And because V is a linear function and V is the line integral of EDL, if V is linearly proportional to L, then E does not depend on L. So therefore, 
E does not depend on L. L. So E is uniform. That is cool. So the electric field here that's generated is just some number. And it's some number doesn't doesn't change um, doesn't change from here to there. So if this is one volt that gets developed over a meter, then the the field here that is you know the field that's separating these charges um, is one volt per meter, and the field that's compensating for it is also one volt per meter. Okay, so so the question is now we have a wire that's moving through a magnetic field. As a result, there is an induced EMF. As a result, there's a current that starts to flow if this wire is connected to some external circuit. Because of that current flowing, there is a Lorentz force that is generated in the opposite direction. What happens after? Well, what happens after is a function of what are you doing to this wire? So if this is a wire that you are moving because you have, let's say, something rolling down a hill, then it's just gravity that's going to keep pushing it with a constant uh, constant force, right? Um, because it's just gravitational force. If it's something that is um, if it's something that's generating a um, um, if if it's something that is uh, being being pushed, then it all depends on how how fast you're pushing it. Um, so so it all depends what uh, what happens. And in fact, I'll, uh, what what you know what the nature of that external force is. Um, if, in fact, one thing that we could talk about as well is the fact that when you have a loop that is moving through a magnetic field, you know what? That loop is going to generate a magnetic field itself because we got a current carrying wire, and current circulates, so therefore there's a magnetic field, and that's what we will talk about next. All right. So uh, so. The fact that E is uniform also means that this charge distribution will vary linearly, but that's a slightly more slightly more complicated problem. So, um, but rest assured that all those things work out. Okay, so that's the first thing we talked about. So, what is what is the nature of that that big L? Now, the next thing that I want to talk about is um, what is the nature of that um, delta A? So. Delta T. Um, in other words, can we can we change the um, can we change the configuration a little bit, and then see what happens with delta A, delta T. So let's start with a um, similar situation, but now we have instead of uh, so we we'll have the same magnetic field. Now, instead of having the wire in um, the wire pointing straight up, we now have the wire in this direction. Speed is still the same. Now, let us ask the question, what is E? Well, um, E, the EMF, will be L vector V cross B. And then we could do the same thing. We'll get a V B cross L. And then a B L cross with V. Now, it's it's a little hard to see what's what's happening here, but this is our delta A delta T. But it's very easy to see what happens here. So this V cross B is still the same, right? Still the same Lorentz force, except that Lorentz force gets dotted with the vector L, which means that there is going to be a cosine. So this is going to be um, L length times uh, VB 
times the cosine of the angle. And what's the angle here? That's this angle. So um, L is pointing in that direction, VB is in that direction, or sorry, L is in that direction, VB is in that direction. So the, the fact that this wire has a tilt to it means that the, um, that the EMF is smaller. And now L times cosine alpha is the L effective, if you want to call it that way, which is this length. So check this, that is L effective. That is the wire that you can use as something that has a length L, where you can still take that's L times V times B is going to give you the EMF. So this effective length here is shorter than the total length. And therefore, this delta A delta T is also smaller than you might expect to see based on this L, except in terms of the EMF, we should only consider that part of the length that is perpendicular to the, the velocity of direction. So this delta A delta T is actually still the same. So that's, um, it's still, Oops, delta A, delta T. That's still the same, but now it's not delta A, delta T that you might expect based on this length, but it's delta A, delta T that you might expect based on this length. So this area, this area uh, is something that you find by crossing those two, right? So dotting those two. Okay, now um, what happens when this wire has a, um, has a, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking, has, has, a, has an arbitrary shape. So, because of course, that's what happens next. So this wire is moving in that direction and the magnetic field is still in this direction. then we can no longer do um, do this. We have to do an integral. So we have um, an E is the integral DE, and we'll do the same thing. We'll have a DL vector crossed, sorry, dotted with that V crossed B. Now that DL vector, when you dot it with VB is, is the um, is the you know I need to start drawing a coordinate system. Let's call this the x coordinate system. Is going to be the x coordinate, and if this is in the y direction, is only the x part of that wire. So if this wire is moving in that direction, and that is our dl vector, it's only the component in the x direction that's going to contribute to the um, to the EMF. So that is the X um, V crossed with B. So in other words, this DA that we're going to get is going to be only due to this X direction. So the DA that we'll get is this part. So it's smaller here, smaller there, it's bigger there. If this d axis is all the same. Now, if you take all these all these sections and put them all together, you'll find that the uh, area swept per unit time is just whatever the area is that is swept per unit time, and it's only a function of the vertical length or you know the x length of the wire so let me write that down so 
So only the the size of the wire in the direction of V cross with B yields R E. So it actually makes life a lot easier because then that means you don't need to do direct integration anymore. So you could do this, you could set up some kind of a funky in integral, but it turns out you don't need it because you just only need this size. And that's quite cool. All right, so that's the, that's the nature of this um, delta A, delta T. Now, there is another way in which you can, do, can induce an EMF. And um, that one, I'm going to write down. So you have a, um, an EMF, which is um, that B, uh, delta A, delta T. And the question is, are there other things that can change that would also give you an EMF? And without any derivation, I'm gonna say, yes, there is. Because we can pull this B in, and then in the dot product. And now this B times A is actually using the flux, magnetic flux that we have defined before. So it's the delta flux delta T. So what do we mean by delta flux delta T? Well, magnetic flux, remember, is a way to count number of field lines. So another way to look at this EMF is the EMF is equal to how many field lines per unit time you paint over, right? So if you're going slow, you got two, three, four, and of course, you know, field lines are actually a uh, continuous measurement, but you see what the idea is. And if it's longer, you're gonna get two, four. If you have it shorter, it's gonna be one, two. So the flux per unit time is basically how many field lines you're painting over when you move that roller from here to there. Now, there are, um, there are other ways in which you can use, uh, in which you can um, change the flux per unit time. So for instance, if you, look at, if you look at this expression, you can also say it's, um, so it's either the uh, B with a delta A, delta T, or it's um, A, delta B, delta T, or, or um, A, oops, A, B, come on, D, cosine alpha, DT. So you can change the area for unit time. You can change the magnetic field per unit time, or you can change the angle per unit time. So what do I mean by that? Well, um, this is the example that we had before. So this is a, uh, is a wire moving through a magnetic field. Okay. This example is a time varying magnetic field that you um, that you pick up. So for instance, you could have a loop that is subject to a magnetic field. Let's call it, let's do it this way. And this B is a function of time. So for instance, we could have a, gener a magnetic field that is um, generated by a, um, uh, generated by a solenoid, for instance. Or we could have, in this case, a rotating loop. So that's a loop and it's rotating. So 
So now the field is constant. B is constant. But we can still change the flux that goes through this wire per unit time by just rotating it. So those are the three ways in which you can do um, induce an EMF. And now finally, I need to write down what this thing is. And this is E is, and we're going to write this as a um, uh, derivative, DDT phi B. And this is known as Faraday's law. And this E is the generalization to Maxwell 2. So remember that Maxwell 2 was that EDL is zero. And now we are actually gonna say it's actually, it's DDT phi B. And I'm gonna put a minus here, but I, uh, I don't wanna talk about the origin of the minus yet. So it's a generalization of Maxwell two. So this electric field, usually if we have an electric field, it's a conservative field, except if we have some kind of a way to change the way that the flux is, that is threading that loop. And then this field is no longer conservative. And that's the only way, if you think about this, that's the only way in which you can get a circulating current to begin with. So when we were talking about that uh, wire gen generating electric energy and uh, dumping that into that resistor as heat, the only way to do that is if the electric field is no longer conserved because otherwise, you know, you go move the charges in the loop. Um, there should not be any energy gain or losses. So there you go. So that's the generalization of Maxwell two. Okay, so let's let's talk about um, let's talk about some some applications. So I already said that this can be used for energy generations, uh, energy generation. So let's uh, let's do that. So let's describe what happens when we have a generator. So a simple generator, oops, generator. And um, this is a, uh, this is a generator that is, uh, it's actually quite close to how actual electric generators work. So it's not too bad. Now, we're going to use the same loop, um, but now instead of having a current, oops, I'm not drawing this straight, sorry. Now instead of having a current that is externally applied to make this thing, uh, to make this thing rotate, we have some other way to mechanically make it rotate. So we have an external torque. external torque that rotates the loop. So let's say it rotates around this axis. Oops, I should stop putting. So that's our rotation. So that's our torque. It's up this direction because it's rotating in this direction. And now um, this loop has a surface area of, let's call it, uh, uh, let's make it easy, one meter squared and rotates with a frequency of, uh, 10 hertz, so goes around in a circle with 10 times a second. 
in a magnetic field. of let's call it 10 millitesla. Calculate E of T. And the E is measured here. So we have some kind of a voltmeter, doo -doo -doo, and we measure E of T there. In this case, this um, magnetic flux is changing as a function of time. Um, and it is changing not because the field is changing, not because the area is changing, but because the angle between the field and the area are changing. So it's DDT B times A times the cosine of the angle. Now the angle that's alpha is now a function of time, where alpha is the usual definition. Alpha is omega times t. So that's ddt of b a cosine omega t. All right, now we take the derivative. So cosine, a bit of minus b a omega sine omega t there's a minus sign here we can we can talk about that minus sign uh we do know that um what those numbers are so it's minus two pi omega was um it's two pi f so f is 10 hertz so times 10 b was 10 millitesla so that's 10 to the minus two and the surface area was one meter so that's sine omega t so it's about uh 2 pi over 10 sine omega t 2 pi over 10 is uh what shall we call it you know a little somewhere between 1 and 2 let's call it 1.5 volts something like that so that's the that's the voltage so this voltage that gets generated between here and there is the voltage that is generating and it's oscillating with a frequency of you know 10 hertz so it goes up down up down up down so we can draw e of t it's minus sine so we start negative up down up it goes to whatever that is so let's call it 1.5 volts and uh, one tenth of a cycle, cycle later, sorry, one time of a second is one cycle later. So two tenths of a second, we're two cycles in. So there you go. That's what E of T looks like. Um, this is a pretty, pretty decent schematic representation of how electric generators actually work. Um, usually involves things, wires rotating through magnetic fields, and the varying flux is the thing that. Um, generates the um, generates the emf so now finally um, if the external field varies as a function of time with time let's say b of t is some b naught cosine omega t then E of T is going to be, again, the time derivative of this thing, but now it's B A omega sine omega T with a minus. So um, for instance, we could have, and this is the, this is the system that we will describe uh, next class. We could have two solenoids. So one solenoid like this, do, 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 do that is generating the magnetic field, that is generating the magnetic field, goes like this, so that's B of T. And then we put a pickup solenoid here, that is our green loop, that's the one that we actually wanna use for measuring the EMF, and this is where our E of T gets generated. 
And of course, it's negative because cosine omega t takes the derivative is minus. It's just we started with a cosine. Doesn't really matter. Um, so now there's this e of t that gets generated because we have a b of t. So this time varying current in this loop causes a time varying voltage in this loop. And this is how transformers work. And in fact, if you have a, uh, if you have a wireless, uh, sorry, if you have a uh, electric toothbrush, that's actually how it charges. So there's this, in the base of the toothbrush, there's this thing that has a little, little post and that post contains this coil. And then when you put your electric toothbrush over it, it has built in these pickup coils. And when you put them together, this is the current that's being pulled from your AC plug. And this is the voltage that charges your battery. So that's pretty cool. Um, that's, that's how induction work, uh, in, uh, sorry, how generation works. And this general phenomenon is known as magnetic induction.